I am Dr. Deepa Dubey, Associate Professor at the Rajiv Gandhi School of Intellectual Property Law, IIT Kharagpur. The module for today's discussion is Indian Penal Code, the Historical Development. Before we move on to the discussion, let us know the learning outcomes of the module. To make the learners understand the criminal law as existent prior to British era, to make the learners understand the development of criminal law during the British rule and third to make the learners appreciate the process of the making of the Indian Penal Code. To start the discussion, the Indian Penal Code is the major substantive criminal law applicable to the territory of India. It covers a plethora of offences whether against the individual or property or state and prescribes punishments for the same. The code has been enacted way back in 1860 and is the handiwork of the British colonial masters who wanted to resolve the utter chaos and confusion prevailing in the then administration of criminal justice in India. The making of the Indian Penal Code is not confined to the years under Macaulay and thereafter. The ancient land owing to its origin to thousands of years had its own criminal justice system. Over a period of time, the invasion by foreigners implanted into the soil elements of a diverse system and the codification of the penal code has to be appreciated in the backdrop of this development. This module will trace therefore the historical development of the Indian penal law till the codification in 1860. About the ancient law, in ancient period we come across the Hindu laws. The king was enjoined to dispense justice to his subjects. Punishment was considered to be a sort of expiation which removed impurities from the man of sinful promptings and reformed his character. Apart from punishment, compensation for wrongs was also imposed by the king. Arthashastra, Manusmriti and Yajnavalka Sriti are the three leading law codes of ancient India of which Manusmriti marks an epoch in the legal history of India and contained not only the ordinances relating to law but a complete digest of the then prevailing religion, customs and usages observed by the people. In Manusmriti, law was discussed under 18 principal heads covering both modern, civil and criminal branches of law. It specifically recognized assault, defamation, theft, robbery, violence to the body, adultery, altercation between the husband and wife and gambling as crimes. Later on, Manu added cheating, trespass or the transgression and fornification to the list of offences. Manu enjoined the king either to dispense justice himself with the assistance of counsellors or to appoint a court or a judge. He further mentioned that the administration of justice may be entrusted to the three regenerate classes but never to a shudra. As regards punishment prescribed, they included 
censure, rebuke, fine, forfeiture of property and corporal punishment which included imprisonment, banishment, mutilation and death. The quantification of these punishments by the king was regulated by a set of principles laid down and the factors indicated in the code itself. Yajna Valka and Brihaspati also state that there are four methods of punishment namely by gentle admonition, by severe reproof, by fine and by corporal punishment. Yajna Valka laid down that the king should inflict punishment upon those who deserve it after taking into consideration the following a the nature of the offence, b the time and place of the offence and c the strength, age, avocation and wealth. Certain classes of persons were exempted from punishment under the ancient criminal law in India. An old man over 80, a boy below 16, women and persons suffering from diseases as well as a child less than 5 years of age. In addition to this, the principles of individualization of punishment was meticulously worked out. The severity of punishment thus depended largely on the caste of the accused. Next comes the Muslim criminal law. Before the advent of the British, the Muslim criminal law was prevailing in India. The origin and fountain of Muslim criminal law is the Quran which is believed to owe its origin to divine inspiration. Again, the rules of conduct, sunnat, deduced from oral precepts, actions and decisions of the prophet constituted the secondary source. Concurrence of the companions of Muhammad and the aid of analogy constituted respectively the third and fourth source of Muslim law. Hidaya and Fatwa e Alamgiri expounded the criminal law. The former laid down the general rules and principles, while the later was a collection of case laws. The traditional Muslim law broadly classified crimes under three heads, crimes against God, crimes against the sovereign and thirdly crimes against private individuals. So far as the first category was concerned, it included such crimes such as apostasy, drinking, intoxicating liquors, adultery, etc. The second category included such crimes as theft, highway robbery and robbery with murder. The third category included offences as murder, maiming, etc., offences against the human body. Accordingly, the Muslim criminal law arranged punishments for the various offences into four distinct categories, viz. Had, Tazir, Kisa, which was commutable to dia. Kisa, kisa or retaliation meant in principle life for life and limb for limb. Kisa applied to cases of willful killing and certain types of grave wounding or maiming. Kisa or retaliation was regarded as the right of man, hakka admi and not of public or God. It gave to the injured party or his heirs a right to inflict a like injury on the wrongdoer as he had inflicted on his victim. Dia meant blood money. In cases like unintentional injuries, Dia was awarded to the victim on a fixed scale. In cases where Kisa was available, it could be exchanged with Dia or blood money. All these were crimes against human body. Practically, the punishment of dia was alternative to kisa. Had, had etymologically meant boundary or limit. In criminal law, it meant specific penalties for specific offenses. 
The underlying idea was to prescribe, define and fix the nature, quantity and quality of punishments for certain particular offences which the society regarded as antisocial or anti-religious. These offences were characterized as being against God or in other words against public justice. Some of the hard punishments were death by stoning, amputation of a limb or limbs and flogging. The fourth tazir, tazir meant discretionary punishments. These punishments were inflicted at the discretion of the judge as there were no fixed rules. Usually these punishments consisted of imprisonment, exile, corporal punishment, boxing on the ear or any other humiliating treatment. Offenses included herein were use of abusive language, forgery of deeds or letters with a fraudulent design, bestiality, sodomy, offenses against life, etc. The Muslim system and administration of criminal justice was in force when the East India Company spread its dominion in India. The British was enjoined to maintain status quo in the matter of civil and criminal justice and their administration, but they later realized that the Muslim criminal law was defective in many respects. It was cruel, too technical and often mitigated the extravagant harshness of its provisions by rules of evidence which practically excluded the possibility of carrying them into effect. The result was, as Stephen remarked, a hopelessly confused, feeble, indeterminate system of which no one can make anything at all. In 1600, a charter was granted which incorporated the East India Company. The charter gave the company exclusive right of trading. In 1609, James I renewed the charter and in 1661, Charles II gave similar powers. The charter of 1668 transferred Bombay to the East India Company and directed that proceedings in court should be like unto those that were established in England. The court of judicature was established in 1672. The court inflicted punishment of slavery in cases of theft and robbery. In ordinary cases of theft, the offender had to pay monetary compensation. In 1683, Charles II granted a further charter for establishing a court of judicature at such places as the company might decide. In 1687, another charter was granted which entrusted Englishmen who came to India with administration of justice, both civil as well as criminal. In 1726, the mayor's courts were established for administration of justice. However, the laws administered were arbitrary as the mayor and aldermen possessed little knowledge of law. The grant of the Diwani included not only the holding of Diwani courts, but the Nizamat also, that is the right of superintending the whole administration of Bengal Bihar and Orissa. Nigam writes that under the Mughal rule, civil and revenue justice were administered under the authority known as Diwani, whereas military and criminal justice was under the Nizamat. In 1765, Robert Clive came to India and obtained the grant of the Diwani of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa from the Mughal emperor. Under the Nizamat, the hierarchy of courts included 
the Nazim as the supreme magistrate having jurisdiction to try capital offenders followed by Naib Nazim who tried lesser offenses. Under him, the Fauzdar, an officer of police to try non-capital offenses and lastly, the Kotwal. This structure prevailed in cities and towns while in the Mufassals, the Zamindars had their own civil and criminal courts in their districts. Only in cases of death sentences, the matter had to be reported to the capital town before actual execution. The first attempt to reform the criminal justice was made after the passing of the Regulating Act 1773 under which new courts were set up. In each district, a criminal court was set up composed of a Qazi, a Mufti and two Maulavis to try criminal cases in presence of a collector and an European supervisor deputed to see that the trial was fairly conducted. A superior court of revision was set up which composed of a Daruga, the chief Qazi, the chief Mufti and three Maulavis. In 1793, another reform was made. In each district, a court was set up composed of a European judge and assisted by Hindu law expert and Mohammedan law expert. Four appellate courts were set up in the towns of Calcutta, Dhaka, Patna and Murshidabad. Each court consisted of three judges and three native experts, namely a Qazi, a Mufti and a Pandit. Above them was Sadar Nizamat Adalat or Supreme Criminal Court at Calcutta. In the presidency towns, the system was little different. There were mayor courts and then came the Supreme Court and justices. Of the Regulating Act of 1773 authorized the Crown to establish a Supreme Court at Calcutta consisting of a Chief Justice and three other judges. The court was to have power to hear and determine all complaints against any British subjects residing in the territories of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa for any crime, misdemeanors or oppressions committed by them. The charter granted under this act gave to the Supreme Court within its limits all the authority of the court of King's Bench in England. Supreme Courts similar in all respects to the Supreme Court of Calcutta were established in Madras in 1800 and in Bombay in 1823. This reform in the administration of criminal justice led to a problem. The Britishers in these courts began gradually to refer to and rely upon the English law of crimes while the criminal courts in the presidency towns were obliged to follow their own system of law. Such a practice obviously resulted in a non-uniform law of crimes. Along with reforming the courts, it was also necessary to reform the criminal law. Accordingly, Cornwallis decided to judge murder from the intention of the criminal and not from the manner of proceeding was evidently to follow the plainest principles of natural reason. He did not regard it as a violation of the Muslim law but only a rational preference. Furthermore, the option of the next of kin of the deceased to remit the death penalty on the murderer was taken away. In 1791, it was further resolved that the punishments of mutilation should not be inflicted and they were substituted for imprisonment and hard labor. Steps to modify the law of evidence were also taken up during the same time. The regulation of 1797 was an important measure which was inspired by humanitarian and benevolent spirit. 
a large number of persons condemned to pay dia were languishing in prisons, being unable to pay the money involved. The regulation granted relief to these persons. The Sadar Nizamat Adalat was empowered to grant such a relief. It was also decided that fines were to be imposed not for the benefit of private parties, but for the use of the government. The regulation of 1803 tried to introduce specificity in terms of punishment for crimes and thereby do away with the concept of discretionary punishment under Tazir. Punishments for perjury and forgery were enhanced. Exemplary punishments were prescribed for decoity. The law relating to adultery was rationalized and modified, etc. Now coming to the making of the penal code, the Bombay province was the first one to enact a brief penal code in 1827 under the guidance of Elphinstone, the then governor of Bombay for the Mufassal. The Bombay regulation superseded the Muslim penal law. The Bombay code which was extremely simple, short and remained in force until it was superseded by the Indian Penal Code. When Punjab was annexed in 1844, a short code was drawn up for that province as well. In the province of Madras, Bengal, Bihar, Orissa and other territories acquired by the Britishers, the criminal law as introduced by the regulations was enforced. The Charter Act of 1833 came as a significant step towards the development of criminal law. It introduced a single legislature for the whole of British India with jurisdiction to legislate for all persons and the presidency towns as well as for the Mufassal. Parliament set up a commission to give India a common law. Accordingly, in 1834, a law commission was appointed known as the First Law Commission with Macaulay, J. M. Macleod, G. W. Anderson and F. Millet as commissioners. The commission was directed to take up the preparation of the penal code for India. In the instructions to the commissioners drawn up by Macaulay, Bentham's principles of punishment and his criteria for a code found clear expression. The basic objective and principles of the code was to replace a patchwork of Muslim and Hindu laws overlaid with a mixture of transplanted English laws and East Indian Company regulations to ensure as much as possible a singular standard of justice. The core objectives of the proposed penal code may be described as follows. It should be more than a mere digest of existing laws, cover all contingencies and nothing that is not in the code ought to be law. Crime should be suppressed crime with the least infliction of suffering and allow for the ascertaining of the truth at the smallest possible cost of time and money. Its language should be clear, unequivocal and concise. Every criminal act should be separately defined, the language followed in indictment and conduct found to fall clearly within the definition. Uniformity is the chief end and special definitions, procedures or other exceptions to account for different races or sects should not be included without clear and strong reasons. Macaulay had these principles in mind when he declared uniformity where you can have it, diversity where you must have it but in all cases 
certainty. The work on the penal code took over two years. The commission submitted their report on 1835 and the draft penal code on May 1837. The recommendations of the commission did not however find immediate acceptance of the government. The governor general in council was of the opinion that some steps need to be taken to revise it. The draft penal code was thoroughly revised by the commissioners C. H. Cameron and D. Elliott submitted their report on July 1846 followed by a second report submitted on June 1847. In 1851, it was referred to the judges of the Supreme Court of the three presidencies, the Advocate General of Madras and other judges and jurists for their opinion. The Court of Directors in London who were anxious to see the penal code enacted as early as possible added a fourth member to the commission and the report was sent to the committee for revision. It consisted of J. P. Grant, Sir Burns Peacock, James William Colville, D. Elliot and Moffat Wills. The committee after intensive deliberations decided to recommend to the legislative council that the penal code originally proposed by the commissioners under T. B. Macaulay should form the basis of the system of penal law to be enacted for India. The final and revised penal code was prepared and brought in by Peacock, Colville, Grant, Elliot and Arthur Buller. The revised penal code was read for the first time in the legislative council on December 1856 and then for a second time in January 1857 and thereafter it was referred to a select committee which was to report thereon after April 1857. The Indian Penal Code Bill after its second reading was published in the Calcutta Supplementary Gazette on January 21st, 24th and 28th, 1857. It was finally passed by the Legislative Council of India and received the assent of the Governor General in Council on October 1860. However, the date of its enforcement with the view to enabling the people, the judges and administrators to know of the provisions of the new penal code was deferred till January 1st, 1862 by the amending act of 1861. Thus, it is evident that the Indian Penal Code 1860 is an outcome of the vision and laborious efforts of about three decades, particularly that of Lord Macaulay, the main architect of the code. In its drafting, the commissioners no doubt derived much valuable help from the French Penal Code and Livingston's Code of Louisiana, but above all the basis of the Indian Penal Code was the criminal law of England. As has been said, the Indian Penal Code may be described as the penal law of England freed from all technicalities and superfluities, systematically arranged and modified in some few particulars to suit the circumstances of British India. Nevertheless, it met with criticism from later day scholars who resented the importation of the foreign penal code in India. Sir Hari Singh Gore opined that as a code, it is by far the most important piece of Indian legislation cannot be questioned, but that it requires a thorough revision by an expert committee of lawyers is equally undisputable. It is pertinent to note that the Indian Penal Code 1860, it has continued in its operation 
as a major substantive law of the country for more than 150 years. Some amendments indicating new offenses, whether relating to criminal conspiracy, cruelty to married women, or specific offenses against women, etc., have been added over the years to keep the century old penal code in tune with the contemporary social challenges. Thank you.